Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Carson, here to director for Clarion Gaming. We're delighted to be hosting a webinar with Interactive today on keeping active retention and LPV in the post-pandemic world. Uh, just first, before I uh, tell you a bit more about what we'll be discussing today, I just want to mention today's webinar is part of our Marketing Excellent Content series, currently running on our ice365.com website. If you haven't checked out any of the other content we're running as part of this, I strongly recommend that you do. Um, only after this webinar is finished, of course, though, anyway. Um, as any operator active in our gaming space today knows only too well, keeping active players loyal and playing on a regular basis is not easy. Changing regulations, intense competition and no engagement with emerging audiences all contribute to lost revenues for even the most established operators across iCasino and Sportsbook. Today we have Interactive CEO Michael Hansen, Simon Lidson, the CEO of Fast Track, and en Enrico Badamante, founder of iGen. They'll be sharing their insights on how to minimise churned revenues and keep the players playing. I'll let our panellists introduce themselves more fully and where they're positioned in relation to today's discussion in a moment. I just want to mention first, there'll be a Q&A section following the presentation, so please do submit questions as we go along. We'll try to address as many of them as possible in the allocated time. Over to you, Michael. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, start by thanking everyone for watching and uh, thanking you guys for, for uh, joining me in this uh, webinar. And um, I'll uh, tell you a little bit about uh, Interactive. Um, and I don't know if you see the, if we can show the slides. Uh, so Interactive is uh, the industry leader in player activation uh, through uh, Custom-made tech, powered by uh, personal human interaction. So we are offering player engagement through Reactivation Cloud, which is our own pro proprietary software, uh, which we built uh, over the years. And we also launched the Engager, which is basically a tool for, for us to be able to communicate with uh, players in the way that the player uh, wants. So uh, he can choose, he or she can choose the way he or she wants to communicate with, with the operator. And we generate revenue through, uh, for operators through loyalty and retention. Uh, and we engage with players in one-to-one one -one conversations to develop closer relationships on behalf of the operators. And we can take the next slide, please. So I'm Michael Hansen. I founded it, this company in 2008, uh, and uh, we are working with the le leading iGaming brands across the globe in Europe, North America, Latin, and Asia. And uh, as a champion for sustainability and longevity in the sector, we have, we have been instrumental in promoting personalization alongside responsible gaming uh, measures for players. And our cli clients include Batson Group, Hero Gaming, Leo Vegas, Kindred, GIG, Kasumo, Tenbet, Come on, and many more. Uh, so our main focus is uh, personalization, uh, scalable personalization, and then it all started with a with a one-on-one -on -one phone call. Now it's ob obviously something much more because uh, many people want to communicate in other ways too. So we accommodate to that as well with our engager. Uh, and we are always a champion for uh, longevity and, and uh, responsibility and uh, sustainability. Uh, and what's also important is that the operators can connect to our reactivation cloud software through APIs. So basically, we work on their behalf, but we do all the work and they just plug in. So it's, it's a very simple process if you can talk about simple when it comes to integration uh, and data because I would I would think that Simon, for example, would have a debate with me on that. But uh, that's uh, that's about uh, interactive and 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 uh, me. And I'll leave over to to Enrico. So good afternoon, uh, good afternoon, Michael. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the uh, the introduction. So my name is Enrico Bradamante. I am the chairperson and the founder of iGen, and iGen is an industry trade association uh, representing the larger gaming companies that are based in Malta and operating in the international markets, as as we know. 
Um, our mission is essentially to represent the iGaming industry um, and engaging with stakeholders, different stakeholders, uh, once we have identified the key common issues uh, that the industry is facing, being based in Malta, and then to, to drive actions so that we have a positive effect, a positive change, and Malta remains the home of iGaming excellence, uh, which, which it is. Uh, we also have a, an international mandate, of course, because the companies that are based in Malta hold licenses in other jurisdictions. Uh, so this is also part of the charter of the mission that we, we have. Uh, and certainly when it comes to, to players, um, the players are super important to the industry. Of course, they are the customers uh, for us, uh, making sure that uh, we are responsible actors across the chain uh, is, is one of the, the, the key tenets that we, we must have as an industry. Over to you, Simon. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm I'm Simon, and um, I'm the co-founder of Fast Track and the CEO of Fast Track. And uh, in case you haven't heard about Fast Track at this time, we are set out to digitalize the gaming industry and deliver the first self-learning engagement platform. So we are straight in the mix when it comes to these sort of questions and working closely with operators. Uh, especially around their operational headaches in order to overcome those technology barriers. So Fast Track works exclusively with the, with the iGaming industry and uh, we were the first to market with a CRM that was built specifically for iGaming and running exclusively on real-time data. Um, and Fast Track, one of the differentiating points is that it's vastly more efficient to work with compared to other platforms in the market. And we have just recently rolled out a range of initiatives that is going to help operators scale with one-to-one -one experiences. And that includes the Singularity model, which is a comprehensive engine in order to match content with players, the data studio that allows you to do mining and visualization of all of that real-time data you're sending, and the Singularity project, which is an initiative to create the most comprehensive um, iGaming intelligence hub for player engagement and CRM. So I'm uh, excited about joining Enrico and Michael today and uh, have a good chat about um, lifetime player values and, and, and retention in particular. Thank you guys. Thanks all. Um, that's great. Thanks guys. Um, right. So let's uh, let's get the discussion started then. Um, I think my first question um, was just going to be an overarching question, really, because uh, people have been, the industry have been talking um, about, you know, the rising costs of acquisition necessitate, necessitate, necessitating a greater focus on retention and reactivation for many years now. I mean, I just want to sort of ask the panel, I mean, how successful has the industry been in upping its game here? And um, leading on from that, how is it doing versus other relevant sectors as well? Who wants to take that one first? I, I can I can start. Um, I, I think first of all I think this has been a, honestly a discussion since five or six or even seven years. Maybe not ten years ago there was no discussion about this. I would say, but since five or six, seven years people started talking about that, and they say it's so important, so important, and and still I see little action, honestly. Uh, what we have seen, though, is that the CRM teams of, of, of the operators are, are putting a lot of effort into, into uh, making aut automated flows and automated uh, structures out there, uh, but that's not being uh, focusing on retention and reactivation. That's fo focusing on, on doing you know, as much as possible with as little effort at as possible and then they actually say oh but we are personalization first uh, pers we are doing personalization which i think is is a misuse of the world of, of the word it's not what it is you know to send out bot calls to a specific segment is not being personal at all uh, to sending out emails to 
to a specific statement is, is not being personal either. Uh, if you're personal, then you actually try to research what your customer wants and you even might listen to him. I'm not saying everyone has to get a phone call because it's not sustainable to call every single person up, but at least do the effort and try to, to listen to your, to your customers. Uh, so I think there's much, much more to do. I think the industry has come, come, come a long way when it comes to actually starting to segment data and to, to see that we, we, we can do things, but they are not doing the right things. Uh, yet, and they're not granular enough. And, and I could show you immense differences between, dif you know, same brand, different markets, and huge, huge discrepancies when it comes to how customers react to different offers, for example. So, you know, you can have, I'm just going to give you an example. You, you, you have, um, we have one brand a sports brand which which is uh, has customers in Hungary and and Finland for example and we have some samples showing that w the same bonus for example converted 60% in in one of the markets and and 13% on the other market if it was a sports book bonus and then it was completely the, the the other way around if it was a casino bonus and you know it's it's a factor four or factor five, and it's the same brand but on different markets. So it's so so important not to you know oh, this is same demographic, same geo geoeconomic region, not to bundle too much because then you're going to do the complete wrong thing. But you feel you have a logic because oh it's the Scandinavian it's the Scandinavian re region they should be fairly similar. But our data show that in some respects they're not similar at all. There might be more similarities between Peru uh, and, and, and Norway than between Sweden and Norway in some respects, in how they, you know, just uh, uh, how they respond and, and the values. And I think that is why I'm talking about if, if it's so dif difficult to understand what the specific market wants. How can you then believe that you're going to be able to understand your customer without trying to at least listen to them and, and trying to understand what they need and be, and be more granular? I can I can follow up on you, Mike. I, I think mm -hmm. uh, they, they, you said some really interesting stuff there. I've been I've been before um, we founded Fast Track. I was on the operator side for a long time, and and many of the reasons why or the whole hot reason why we started Fast Track was because we felt that it wasn't moving quickly enough and there was too many barriers for, for scaling in the right way. You said a couple of really interesting stuff on there. Number one, that two brands operating in the same market can have completely different results coming out of that market. I see exactly the same thing. So the, I, I think that reels into a couple of different things. Then also the personal personalization and one-to-one, and -one, which is one of the most important aspects that we work with at Fast Track and why we rolled out an entirely new engine right now. I want to touch on that in a second. Um, but yes, the way obviously interactive um, approaches your, your whole business model is, is based on one-to-one -one experiences. Um, however, everyone else needs to be able to scale also with one-to-one -one outside of a personal conversation. And that's a little bit where Fast Track is coming in, right? I, I believe that you know, there is tremendous value in all of the channels that you're using. There, there are so many vast amount of channels right now, whether you're using emails or SMS or push or mobile notifications. There is vast amount of value in all of them. Uh, but yes, we tend to oversimplify things. Um, we, we, don't, we don't really have the platforms and the tools to help us move that along. And it's not helping that we have been in, in this sort of regulatory pressure for a very long time as well, because we, we were set up in a certain way, I would say in 2016, where we were like sort of operators had um, a good amount of resource and actually had a bit of time to do the right way. But then along the way, like 2017, 2018 and, and onwards, there has just been the complexity of operational, how, how the operational landscape looks like has been incredibly, is incredibly more difficult now and, and more uh, tense on, on the resource. Now, has how much has happened? That was one of the first questions between like then and now. 
I, I think there has been developments. I, I see like good things that have happened. We are, we are better at targeting, we are better at segmentation, we are better at mining our data. Have we moved fast enough? No, not even close to as fast as we were. We, we, we should have moved in terms of achieving, um, you know, extracting that value, getting that retention, the loyalty around our customers. It's, it's, it's far simplified. With the regulation in mind, we have focused a lot about profitability. It's been about doing the job, making it easier to do what we did previously. Um, but yes, now we have that hurdle we need to overcome. But I think like the answer to why a lot of those brands that you see that might be operating in the same market have such a significantly different result is because I think there is still a lot of operators that are shooting from their gut. You know, they are like sort of, they are, they are used to do things in a certain way and continue to do, do it in that way. And then there are other operators that are maybe a little bit more scientific and, and data driven as, as, as organizations. And they, they are not just doing things for the sake of doing it. They actually validate and experiment and prove um, essentially what matters and that it yields results. So I, I think that's a, that's a key topic to touch on today as well. <clears throat> Enrico, do you have anything to add on this? Yeah, just just a, a few considerations, maybe higher level considerations, if you if you want. So when we talk about players' lifetime value, uh, I think we have to consider the two words: lifetime and value. And both of those are directly influenced by what, of course, the operators are doing, um, and what uh, companies like Interactive and Fast Track are are, are doing. And even within that, we are seeing some, some vast differences. Uh, certainly from a, a provider perspective, uh, we saw games performing very differently uh, in, in different markets and within the same markets between different operators. Uh, so, so clearly there is a variety of executions uh, that, uh, that differs uh, from, from market to market. Um, the other consideration you asked about, uh, you know, how do we compare against other industries? And I think all of us are, uh, are also users of consumers of other digital entertainment, of other digital content. Uh, and we have models like Amazon or like Netflix, where we ourselves are the customers and we are used to a very seamless experience. And especially when we put this in the optics of the, uh, the new players, uh, the players that are not already being acquired, uh, they are used, and, and the younger players especially, the players of the future, um, they are used to a completely different and much more seamless experience. So I think these are all considerations that we should bear in mind as an industry uh, when we look at maximizing uh, mm. in a responsible way the player lifetime value. I find tagging on to you there, Enrico, is like something that is worth mentioning because we do look up to a lot of services that are around us, right? And, and how we are living our daily lives and how we're interacting with those services. What I find so fascinating about iGaming and one of the reasons why I am sort of still here and like working in this industry is because of how the complexity of this landscape compared to any other industry. I mean, there are so many different elements which makes this challenge like to overcome this so much harder for us in iGaming than it is than it is to do it in, in, in other spaces. Maybe not on a you know feature by feature you can find you can find bright spots in how we do certain things that are really good and it's really tailored and whether it's recommendation softwares or anything that we're doing. But as soon as we try to we've taken on the challenge of like building a self-learning engagement platform. Okay, so when you start digging into that, you start thinking about player risk. You start thinking about experience and how you measure experience and, and what does experience actually mean on a site. You talk about channels. We talk about, you know, the, the, it starts in, in thousands, how much content there is, like how much vast amount of contents and vendors and games, the, the different sort of options in payment options and how also how local the regulation is in terms of how what you need to do in the UK versus Sweden versus other markets and how that's different. And, and you have all sorts of other challenges that might be local challenges or, or, or even like sort of global challenges. But there are so many different aspects of it that comes into it and makes it more complicated. So I have, I have, a, I have a degree of understanding for why certain things are taking a bit longer. Um, but I, but I, can, I can definitely see it's like happening. We are like on the brink of it right now. I, I feel it. I'm standing in the middle of it, you know, and Michael is standing in the middle of it and you, you as well. 
I can feel it. Like it's very close now where we're going to get to that tipping point where we actually know how to use AI to our advantage, how we know how to use our data to our advantage, how we're getting in touch with our data in real time and all of these different aspects. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I, love, I love how positive you are, Simon. <laughs> From my perspective, uh, I can just say that, you know, there's also been, a, you know, a, a big improvement uh, and obviously, the, this industry has had a tough couple of years uh, with all the different regulations coming in, and also GDPR coming in as a you know quite difficult uh, <laughs> um, regulatory environment, uh, and, and a lot of specifics on how to handle that. And, and obviously, we had to be in the forefront of that because we are all about data. We really need the data to perform our service. So, uh, but, I, but I do feel still, if I'm, if I'm supposed to be completely honest, and I think uh, uh, I should be definitely, um, that in an industry, and actually you, Simon, normally tell me that, in an industry that actually has been online, well, if you forget about the legacy uh, brick and mortar casinos because they weren't online. But if you look at the online part of the, the companies that came, started online, that didn't have the brick and mortar, the fact that they haven't been even faster and better at adjusting to, okay, how do we do this data? How do we, how do we communicate? And the fact that fast track and interactive exist is probably because it became so um, so granular to do different things. They actually need experts to do it better. And I think, uh, you know, I, I think it should be even faster. And, and we, should, we should strive to be faster when it comes to tailor the service to every customer and actually not, we shouldn't get spam emails and SMSs 2021 about something that I'm completely not interested in. And it still happens. Uh, and and I, I'm just like, what's the point? It's just useless. So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I, I, I think we should strive for being even faster. I think a lot has happened, but but we have to be we have to be better and we have to be faster. Thanks, Michael. Um, I want to move on to next is, I just want to get a bit more granular, really. I just want to ask the panel, um, in 2021, I mean, what sort of data and metrics should an operator be using to measure the effectiveness of its approaches to reactive, reactivation and retention? Mm. Who wants to uh, take that no. one first? Uh, sorry to take that one as well, but, but this is a little bit of, of what we actually, uh, this is one of our, you know, where we excel. Uh, because we really need uh, to analyze the data constantly to know that we're doing the right thing. So for us, the LPV, the, the player value, is super, super important. And obviously, deposit levels, NDR, GDR, and all that is also important. But at the end of the day, if you have the LPV, that is a function of all those other metrics. And the LPV is the most important uh, metric at the end of the day. And obviously, LPV is very dependent on how you convert uh, when you want to get the customer back to your site, because that will prolong the LPV, uh, LPV or, or increase it. And also it will, will have to do that when you get the person back, you obviously don't want that person to, to churn. So it's about retention. So this is what we focus on completely. And, and if you have the LPV uh, and then you have conversion and, and, and the retention, that, that, that's all you need. If, if, if that is sustain, sustainable and increasing, uh, then you're doing something right. And we're following up on that on every single market. Uh, and we see huge differences uh, between different markets and between different brands. And uh, you know you're doing something right when it increases. And we are always striving to increase and to feedback our operators that here we're increased on this market. We believe it's because of this. So I, I think it's I think it's pretty, fairly simple. Those, I, those I, want to go in, 
a curveball, Mike. Um, I love like like all of the KPIs that you're talking about are 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 fundamental to a successful business in this space. I I fundamentally agree. So I don't wanna I don't wanna like give people the wrong uh, wrong idea here. But I can find it incredibly difficult. Um, and I, this is something that I would have experienced both when I was working as an operator, also when I'm consulting operators today. The, the, there is this like sort of working, like looking and staring at the LTV is not going to make it better. So I mean, there is like the underlying factors that are going to drive LTV, and 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 I'm like sort of getting more and more convinced, um, backed up by data, and and like sort of building my own PCR of a metric that is overseen quite a lot in in gaming, but it's a core metric for any other entertainment business to look at, which is time. So. You know, we have we have a couple of different people in the room here. Now we got Enrico, we got Steven, we got Michael. I mean, all of us have different, you know, sort of time that we can potentially allocate to have fun, to play or to do any form of entertainment, right? And if we choose to to invest that time in in playing and having a bit of fun playing casino, the the reality is um, that many of us at least for many of us enrico you have a certain disposable income that you're ready to spend at a casino michael you would have the same and steven you would have the same so i mean i can find that you know the, the amount of time like working with that as an operational kpi like time on site time in session and and mesh your loyalty in that way can be really really useful because then you're like sort of what's the end effect of time well the more sticky you are the more you're returning to the same site the more like it's 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 a little bit more of an operational KPI, which I feel fuels really well the the lifetime player value. Mm. Super interesting, and uh, that's something that we we are working with time when it comes to how long we are communicating with the players. Because I have, for example, uh, in Brazil we have four four minute average calls which is fantastic because no one will speak to you for four minutes unless they like the call. Uh, and if you have a four minute average, then you have a, you know, 10, 12 minutes and you, then you have some two minutes and whatever. So that's fantastic. And I think that's, that's just a different uh, angle of, of that aspect. If they spend time with you, then uh, you know, they like it and you know, it's, it, they're, they're gonna, the loyalty will at some point come out of it. Yeah. Uh, whereas in, in Sweden we have, one and a half minute calls. So there we are not as good or the Swedish market is not as receptive right now to, uh, to, our, to, to online gaming or it's saturated or whatever. But, but, but uh, I think it's very interesting what you're saying. I, I agree that the time is also a super interesting uh, metric. And it's, it's also, you know, building on, on what you just said, uh, Simon and, and Michael, uh, it's also, important to to remember that the player is one entity one person uh, but we know that that player has multiple accounts um, mm. and therefore both their time and their potential spend um, will be spread over different operators over different accounts uh, and i think michael you are as because you talk directly to the customers i think you are in a in a privileged position to to optimize that conversation on behalf of your operator, of your customer, uh, and therefore yeah. enhance the experience and, and get more share of wallets of that entertainment budget that Simon was mm. referring to. Mm. Yeah. And it's like that, just to come in with that as well, like it's, it's I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised that Interactive is successful in the services that they are providing. It's quite simple, like I remember, Oh, it was one of the, I think it was my CTO at the time when I was working at Batson Group who, said, who, who, who shared this with me um, in form of an article. I think it was a comparison between two major car brands. I, I believe it was Toyota and BMW. And, and essentially what they managed to conclude was that one of the, one of the manufacturers had no problems with their car. All right. And, and, and that's great. And people were buying cars and it's okay. But the other manufacturer had more problems with their car, but they had such a tremendous service when you came mm. to, the, to the workshop in order to fix it and, and how they, and that was with BMW, of course. So, and having that touch point with the customer created far better loyalty. All right. And repurchases 
than, yeah. than what I ever managed to achieve. And, and, and that's like just an explanation. I don't think we should be afraid about having conversations and having, you know, it's, it's in the end, it's about relationships, right? It's like when, yeah. and, and I think people remember that, players remember stuff like that as well. If, if it was like really painful for me when I won money at this site in order to get it out, you, 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 or, or potentially, you know, it might be confiscated for bad, bad reasons, or they didn't explain to me to have the right expectations on the offers I'm taking, or whatever it might be. Um, every single one of those, every single touch point that we have that looks like that could either be something that has a green light that gives you more loyalty, or something that has a red light that that sort of shuts down things for the future and and produces a bad NPS, and, and essentially people don't recommend each other, etc. Yeah, and I, and I think uh, I mean. I think it's pretty amazing that I only got one phone call before I started this uh, company. Uh, I got one phone call and it, it was not a native Swedish guy calling me. It was, uh, it was party poker uh, calling me 2006 or something from, from India uh, in English. And uh, I mean, it was not a perfect call. There was no cultural like understanding. Uh, he, probably had no clue if, 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 if Swedes like ice hockey or, or play uh, Texas Hold'em or whatever, but it was, he was super nice, uh, friendly person, a real person that actually just welcomed me to the site, asked me if I had any issues. It was probably a one and a half minute call. And so this, I mean, you see here, we're sitting 2021, this is 2006, potentially around there. And I still remember that person and that call. And, and how many emails did I get over the years from different, uh, I don't even know. So obviously, uh, I, that, that was one of the reasons I, I, I started this company, because I believed in that. And also, I, I haven't mentioned this study in a long time, but I think it's a fantastic study uh, that was made over in, in the US uh, for during a period of, I think, 20 years by by the Equality Association uh, Group, uh, which is the ISO uh, certification group in the US. And uh, they made a huge study and they asked generally over massive amount of brand uh, markets and different products, why do you leave a supplier? And number one came up because it doesn't matter. They don't need me. I don't feel that they value me as a customer, so I might as well just try something else. It was not because the product was bad. You know, if, if no one cares, maybe I should try another car now, or maybe I should do something else. So that came up as the number one. And we have done studies in the online gaming as well. In some markets, it comes still up, come up, comes up at more than 50% change because it doesn't, uh, it, well, the operator doesn't care anyway. In some markets, it's much less because it might be that it's, it's very product focused market. At the end of the day, I do believe that the product is at the end of the day key. That's the hygienic factor. If you have a really good operating site, that is number one. But I think then comes the communication and understanding the customer as a second. Uh, but but pr product is at the end of the day uh, number one still. So I, I don't want to you know take that away because I think. That's the main hygienic factor. I mean, if a car doesn't even work and it doesn't matter how much you, you call or, or try to be nice to the person that bought the car because the car, car, is actually, car actually doesn't work, mm. right? It's obviously. No, exactly. I, I just wanted to like, obviously we, we touched on a couple of KPIs. Um, you, you touched on a couple of KPIs at least, Michael, that was very core um, to any business mm. operator right now. And I threw in a little bit of a curveball there on time, just because I think it's mm. interesting as a as a as a uh, perspective on things. Now I I, I don't want to uh, forget to mention that it, it is a hugely complex business, all right. And this is like people have noticed that who's who's got into to i gaming uh, late, they they had a, a huge learning curve, and and uh, people who came in early has had the same, but in a, in a little bit of a more timely fashion. But I mean, there are there are so many aspects. Um, if you if you wanted to look at reactivation retention specifically, you must have the data that is like you have to have a 360 mm. of your customer at any time. You need to be able to see 
you, you need to be able to drill in. There's not like a one overall dashboard that is going to sort of overcome this. You need to be able to mine your data into every individual thing that you are doing so that when you break, when you start breaking down LTV and then you start breaking that down into what you're actually doing to generate LTV, whether you are using something like voice or whether you are using emails or SMSs, it's, it's incredibly important to look at every single one of those um, initiatives and channels in, uh, in, in itself to see how, how well they are converting and where they're converting and how they're converting and what type of behaviors that are being fueled through that um, and, and measure those. And also in terms of reward types, that makes a huge difference in terms of what your spend is, obviously, and how, how you're investing towards that and how you are creating experiences and what those experiences are costing you. And also what the risks are associated to those experiences, because I think it goes forgotten sometimes that the, the community that is trying to abuse our promotions, so take advantage of the bonuses that we are crediting, is a huge one. All right, we're talking hundreds of thousands of accounts in the UK that would do everything that is trying to overcome and win value from your site by, by advantage playing or by taking, taking sort of um, getting the upper hand on the promotions you're giving. And not a lot of operators are getting the visibility around how much is happening around that because it's usually spread out, right? Even, even for the abusers in terms of how volatile that is. So, um, yeah, there is a huge. You need you need to have your data in order uh, across across every single channel and 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 experience that you are delivering, and you need to to be able to produce that engine room and how is is all fitting together and feeding into one another. Mm. Thanks, Simon. Um, I sort of move on. I think we've look at the head to sort of main headwinds. I mean, we've, I think we've already established that. Uh, I think you guys see the main headwind as the main headwinds to. Um, you know, keeping players lower than playing on a regular basis um, is the, oper the, the operator's approach of the operators. Um, I think, Simon, you kind of think that the operators were kind of a bit more, you know, we're actually a tipping point of actually better using the tools at their disposal. But I think what I'd like to do is sort of talk about the other sort of headwinds. Um, you know, what's, how, how important are those? How important is regulation, uh, competition? Um, are those, are those, important factors here, the important headwinds, or they're just paling to insignificance next to the approach um, when compared to the, how the operators are actually handling this area of their business at the moment? I would steal that one and you say it's hugely important. Like I, I, I like that we're touching on regulate, regulation a bit because we have something that is very evident is that as operators, we have gone from providing a global uh, a product to a global market, all right? A little bit like that at least to in very few amount of years sort of translating that into a local market like that we are attacking and we have been set up in a different way as organizations so i i can completely see the headache that has been uh, emerging out of out of this challenge where you've had teams that are you know central teams and then trying to figure out how should i structure my organization in order to get around this and and be able to target because the amount of operational overhead that you have is is super high Okay, and creating the internal processes in order to overcome that, whether it like I can take something simple, okay, just to use as an example, but the, the, the reviews that are happening, like most of the time you need to do a compliance review of any campaign that has been sent in any market at this stage, um, like or, or especially in the regulated market. So if you're going to UK and you want to do a campaign, you don't just send that. You don't just rely on a junior team or potentially like uh, someone, a content, a content team that is like sort of producing you a... Um, a reward you need to run it by legal for example so th this is just one part that has been introduced in a process that was quite lean in the past and then on top of that you have technology barriers so you have you have like sort of platforms that have not historically been designed to handle these sort of things so you have to move those operational processes elsewhere and try to sort of put put tape in between those if you may so you what you do is that you have a crm platform that is super basic um, from the very beginning and then you have had to go into another process where you take whatever you have in that and lift that out and put that in an email or in a Google sheet. And then you have to sort of share that somewhere else, just like you do with uh, translations or anything else, right? And, and that was like, I think that was the, the biggest win that we had in the beginning when we came in and, and sort of, okay, we introduced a rework, we're reworking the process in order to, to tackle these things so that you can still be a central team, but you're able to 
provide a product to 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 sort of a, still work it as a uh, with a central team around local markets that you can put the safeguards in place you can put the process in place you can put the governance there without it affecting you as a team you don't have to have local teams per, 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 uh, in in order to achieve that but it has a huge impact i would say um is is the is the short but <clears throat> simon isn't that also a bit uh, like a like a moat created for the big players so it's almost like the small players won't even get over that moat they'll just leave the market because it becomes too complex for a smaller organization so at the end of the day you'll have the bigger ones that are able to throw bodies at the problem or throw more tech money at the problem they they will be able to to take to the you know take it to the next uh, plateau and from there you'll have the same again that okay now we that we did this let how do we work with with lpv from where we are now so i think it's it's like it becomes all the regular regulatory changes and gdpr become almost like a uh, like a hygienic factor it's almost like okay so if we take the car uh, thing again here okay now you have to have a, an automatic thing on the car you have to have a you know an airbag or whatever whatever and a smaller car producer won't be able to to uh, to fit, to do that because it's just too small he can't do the investment so he, he's out so yeah, I think I think it, it, it even might be one and zero with regulation, and we've seen that that some some operators just leave markets because yeah. and obviously then you get zero LPV because because you you have no players left, right? So uh, that, I, I, that would, is the I, most... I would agree to that with a with a slight uh, adjustment. I see a couple of nimble operators that if you want to call it that like agile guys that are that, that tend to figure it out and they've man, in many cases actually created a local approach that yeah. they, they are very consciously moving into certain markets yeah. that are local. but you're right like in in general when we talk about lifetime player value the, the the one of the main considerations you need to ask yourself is obviously the profitability of the players i mean you are in many cases regulation has has failed even towards the player because mm. there is so much being um, the channelization is is so huge, right? So you have so many unregulated operators that is picking up picking up where you are lefting off, right? So if you left them off and they had player limits that they have achieved or they blocked themselves or whatever, they have this huge network of of unregulated operators that they can start working with or start playing at, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, I, I think um, um, unfortunately, that has been that is something that we still haven't figured out in the regula regulatory landscape, and that has a huge impact, not only from a tax perspective because it costs money to, to sort of more money to um, to maintain players, and also obviously all of the safeguards that are put in place. Arguably, we can argue uh, they are there for the right reason, but because you can circumvent them with unregulated operators, they are not really having the effect that we want them to have. Um, mm. Then, then you have. A huge cost with that as well, right? Because it's, it's it, the foundation is that we all need to we need to make sure that in order to protect the player and and do it the right way, that needs to happen. Um, then everyone needs to play by the same rules, you know. Um, so I mean, uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, but from a lifetime value perspective, the regulation has a huge cost with that as well. So I think yes, the larger companies benefits because they own a larger piece of the value chain, whether it be platforms. And have more power to negotiate rates with providers, etc. But, but Simon, I also want to say, uh, um, generally here, then again going back to what we have seen in in our ten years of op operation here, is that some players, smaller, agile, uh, newer tech, even that you know they don't have the legacy technology, which can be very bad for some of the bigger ones. That they are just stuck in all their uh, tech stacks or whatever you want to call it. So we have seen some some smaller operators handling regulation and and uh, you know data handling generally extremely well mm. because they are granular, because they're fast, because they care and they have nimble organization as, as well. So let's not. You know, say that it's only the big ones. It, it's the big ones and then the nimble small ones. 
Yeah, I'd like to also add a little bit of a, of a perspective because uh, regulation is, is, of course, a good thing in, in theory, uh, but the vast majority is, is uh, not really based on, on facts. It's based on uh, uh, largely political uh, decisions. Um, and I think as, a, as an industry, uh, we are lacking uh, hard data, hard facts to base uh, whether it's a regulation or a recommendation for a new regulation. And this is where I think that the work that you're doing, Simon, and that you're doing, Michael, and that others are doing in the industry uh, could really help to guide in the discussion with the various regulators in coming up with standards that are more common. Because, you know, here we're talking about only the player life has value, but there are so many different areas with regards to responsible mm. gaming, with regards to affordability criteria, etc., that are uh, piecemeal, that you know, are done uh, country by country, regulator by, by regulator. So I, I think uh, you know, all, all this um, fantastic work and, and data that you sit on and experience uh, is something that we can leverage as an industry to engage the regulators on a gold standard that would make everything much simpler operational. Yeah, I th there is definitely um, value in that, Enrico. I, th I think um, I, I would be more than happy to, to be a participant party in, in 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 such an exercise for sure. I know that Michael would probably say that that would be something he would like to do as well. Yeah. Um, but I still like my what's my pragmatic choice of, of action as fast track in this world? Well, I need to create a platform and a technology that is flexible enough so that I can mold it so that the operational scalability is maintained, regardless of what local regulatory framework they choose to implement. So it's like that's my challenge most of the time has been that we need to be able to provide this service and we need to be able to we need to enhance it and build the technology so that it doesn't become a blocker even w whether it's a, a good regulation or policy or whether it's like mm -hmm. a, a not so good um but we everyone is hugely affected by this i think so it's it's i, I would be more than happy to participate in yeah in, uh, in such in some, in an initiative like that there's something you should do enrico you, isn't that your yeah homework? let's do it let's yes. let's promise everyone that we'll start uh you know, a body here that will focus on uh, on learning by numbers how to, we can uh, improve yeah. sustainability in the industry and showing uh, everyone around us uh, where things or when things are working, not working. Definitely, and we have so much data to to, to work with uh, because we talk to you know, we reach out to thirty thousand players every day. So you know. Obviously, you get a lot of data from that. Absolutely. Uh, okay. And um, I'm just uh, in a moment. I want to move on. Just want to touch and uh, dig a little deeper into the communication channels um, in a second. But first, I just want to sort of, as the title of the webinar, um, coming back to that a little bit. I mean, what um, what impact, if any, has the pandemic had on players' engagement and uh, loyalty behaviours? Yeah. I told you I'll, I'll hijack this one because I I rule it out. I, I told Steve and, uh, and the guys uh, that I don't believe there's going to be a big change because we were online already before the pandemic. So that was my main thesis. So our BI uh, team, uh, but then I felt I can't just say things. I can't just assume that. So I had the BI team look into our big, some of our biggest uh, uh, customers and just analyze the numbers. And it's absolutely insane how how equal the spend LTV is before pre-pandemic, and if we now can say that we are post-pandemic, but we argue about that too. But at least we are not pre now, and we are at least close to post. Um, and the data we have is, for example, we've done one operated two two point one percent up post versus pre uh, and another operator zero zero point four percent up so there's and then we have a third one which is only a sports book uh, operator that was 
they were 36 percent up but mainly i think mainly because of the euros honestly yeah. uh because during the pandemic they were zero they were five point five percent up and that's also strange that they would be up during the pandemic because you had a period where there were on, on, almost no sports at all so yeah. so and, and these are large large numbers it's not 200 customers we were talking several several thousands uh, data points so it, it's very valid and i think that I, I just wanted to say that 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 at least our data show that there's very little change in the behavior pre and, and post hmm. and, and I, I don't think it's strange because this industry was already online before uh, yeah, as opposed I mean, to shopping trades or whatever I mean, there is no, there is obviously no, no mistake. Um, what a, what a, what a very, very hard time it was during the pandemic for the sports book. That was like the, the, yeah, that was, yeah. that was a, those. Yeah, I, I think that we won. But yeah. they, I, I think from a casino perspective, you're, you're right. We, we operating an, an online business, and if anything, um, it it will have benefited the ones that took the opportunity. I think, in a certain sense, that we, in terms of coming back to time, which became my favorite <laughs> metric right now, yeah. we have had yeah. more opportunity and more time um, to to engage. No question, people have had more disposable time at their hands for these to to engage in entertainment, any sort of entertainment, and then whether. We have been good enough in order to fend off a TV show at Netflix, or whether we have not, or whether we have been better than the, the competitor next to us in providing an exciting offering. Um, that's, an, that's a different question, but uh, you're right in, the, in that, and I wasn't surprised to hear those numbers as well. Um, but I think it's an opportunity, and it's still, it's still there to a degree. Mm. Okay. A question. Oh, okay. um, sorry, a question. Um, Michael and Simon, based on the data that you, you have seen, if you if you take countries like Sweden, for example, they they have um, passed some temporary um, you know restrictions to to players, um, they um, you know affordability amount that they could bet, etc. More more let's say responsible gaming in, in time in quotes uh, measures. Have you seen any impact when it comes to the players uh, lifetime value or satisfaction uh, are there any comments that you can uh, you can uh, shed or maybe even Spain uh, where again yeah. local governments had done some COVID specific yeah. measures to reduce to limit the, the gameplay I, I, I think the, the most obvious one um, I mean when you take Sweden is Sweden is one example which now has an upper roof in how much you can spend um, and and Germany has has similar sort of limits in their regulation and it's been it's been devastating for for many of the operators in those markets uh, transitioning into into such limitations and a hundred percent it's going to affect i think lifetime value by um a, a very radical amount um for many of those operators and um, that are experiencing that sort of change going from one day from not having those sort of limits and, and then having to impose those limits the, the larger problem is though that there is we also um, not me personally but there is also evidence in the industry that says that the unregulated operator has picked up all of that activity so it's not really or pretty much that all of that activity so it's not been that that anything has been done for the players at that sense it's been completely yeah. the opposite it's actually so it's yeah. almost a, a double a double negative to be regulated unfortunately because i am i am the biggest advocate for for uh, safe gaming uh, that's that's like I, I think it's exactly the right thing that we need to do. Um, but I, I'm also disappointed in a, in a sense to certain parts of the regulatory framework and the regulators that haven't managed to create a safe space. You know where where it should be it should be less um, it should be very much more competitive to play with the licensed operator than it should be to mm. and it should be much harder and it should be the, 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 it should be a lesser offering. Um, but right now it's it's not that different if you put it that way. I think. 100% and I can we can see in our data that we have actually that the Swedish uh, market has uh, taken a hit uh, because of these uh, regula re regulatory 
limits and obviously we also have, you know have, have seen uh, or, or heard about the fact that that the that the black market is increasing and that's probably where the money goes and it increases within our uh, license operators uh, and also uh, I, I've so far not seen any report uh, being presented that that uh, that uh, shows that there's increased uh, gambling during the pandemic which was the reason why the Swedish government uh, um, impose the limitations. There just have been no evidence of that. So, yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, right. Um, we've covered a lot of ground. We're into the last few minutes, actually. So, I'd like to, if you guys are okay, I'd like to move on to the Q and A. Um, so it's Q and A. Um, I'm going to kick things off with this one, actually. Um, uh, this one on. We've touched. We've touched on this. Uh, we're going to touch on communication channels. I just want to sort of ask this question. Um, should digital outreach be combined with voice calls to convert lapsed databases more successfully? Or are there different stages of retention communications which benefit from one or the other? Yeah, let, let me take that because this is actually what we saw uh, or we realized after focusing on voice for many, many years. We realized that the millennials uh, and, and the younger generation, they just because we love the voice call and the real personal call doesn't mean that every single person wants to communicate via voice. So we actually changed our approach uh, a couple of, well, a couple of years ago now and realized that we're going to give the, all the customers the, the, the chance to choose. If they want voice, they have voice. If they ha want to chat, they can chat. If they want to act on an email or an SMS even, then that's fine, but they always have the chance to get back to us, start chatting to us, or, or call us back, or schedule when they want to be called back. So it's all, all about actually adjusting to the customer group there. And I, that has given a, a big uplift in just because people just like that you adjust to them. Uh, so I know we don't have more time, but that has been a big, big success. That's that that we just adjust to the to the customers. I think we can uh, Simon or Enrico, anything to add on that one? Yeah, I mean the the I find it like um, it's hard to lean either way because I can see um, a lot of things working on one brand in one specific market very differently to another brand in exactly the same market so it's you have to but that's why you should have the choice because yeah, you know you should have the choice for sure i think i think the point mm -hmm. is here um is that a lot of a lot of channels are being used used in the wrong way okay um we are mm -hmm. we are sort of assuming many things such as that an assumption that often happens is that an sms always converts better than an email for example like it's a it's a simple. I'm not even including voice in that as a channel, but mm. that that's a, that's a false. That's a fiction. All right. Mm. The, the, when you start looking at the data, there is there is a huge there is going to be a huge amount of your database that are opted in for both communication channels and still going to react much better to an email. I think um, choice is good. Uh, I think uh, that that's an unexpected thing that I think works very well. What Michael is talking about. Um, but also like work your data because there 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 is so much truth in in to to be to be found there and I think ask ask the most stupid questions don't be afraid because many of the things that people think they know is just stuff that people have passed on in gen almost like generations uh, but generations of employees at least in in organizations that they thought was true but then have oversimplified with an answer and then no one bothered to look into it because it's just been a fact or it's been yeah. You say it enough times and it becomes a fact. I've seen so many of those. Another another one, which is super interesting, sorry for taking up a bit of time, is um, that personalization, a, a lot of people think that it's a really good idea to to send like the specific game that you that your favorite game when you send free spins, for example, to a player. And I mean, my gut says the same thing. It's like, that should be great. But the reality is that it's a very little little gain in engagement for the simple reason that people just want free stuff 
So it's like if they get three spins on game A or game B, they're still gonna convert. So I mean, there are um, there, there are a lot of questions to be asked in this area, and uh, and yeah, it's it's very exciting to to be asking those questions as well. Thanks, Simon. Um, as yeah, we're right near the end now, but I'm very keen to ask last one actually myself. Actually, um, and what's the optimal age of uh, lapsed databases to be contacted for reactivation? Is three months too soon, or is that too long to wait? Well, I we, uh, we can start, Michael. Yeah, I mean, uh, what we see is that uh, if if you if you wait until six months, you'll you'll have a much harder time converting, uh, and uh, and uh, you're not going to lose much. Not many people will come come back after six months without an actual real personal call to action if they didn't convert after five. So uh, I think there's no point in waiting. But I, I, I would also say, don't, don't uh, outsource or, or, you know, this is a, because then you will start talking about actives. I believe we should focus much more on calling active players. That's going to be the next big thing. And that's what I believe is going to be our next big thing, because it's much more logical to target the 100% PNL instead of target the zero percent PNL, which are the inactive. But if we're talking about inactives, and if we're going to talk about operators, what they should uh, should target, I would say somewhere around two three months would be the sweet spot where you can actually say that this is the action that actually uh, this tar this action was done, and it's because of this action they came back. If you go shorter than that, it might just be a natural thing that they were on vacation for 30 days and then they came back. But if you're talking about two, two to three months, then they've been away so long that then there's no point waiting longer. They're not going to come back anyway. Yeah. That being well, said, I believe we should do actives. That's the next thing. That's the next, that's the, you know, that's the sun and the inactives are the moon. So, Let's so the, do the, the sun. The truth that we can back up with data so easily is that the longer that time passes before you you manage to, if you call it reactivate, the harder mm. it's going to be. 100%. Yes, hundred percent. That we manage data like support, and and also it's much easier to to motivate. That's something else that we can stand behind. It's much easier to to motivate why you should continue to play straight after playing rather than trying to tell you why to come back once you left. So, I mean, yeah, you, exactly. if, you have, if you have someone in a store and they are like shopping from you right now, yes. walk up to them, right? <laughs> I mean, what, what can I do for you? I'm getting yeah, a new um, learning equipment tomorrow. Yeah. Are you coming to check it? Like it and, sell yeah. them, and sell them a car, you know? <laughs> right. On that note, guys, um, we are, we're actually a few minutes over. Um, which I think was well worth it because uh, I think today's been great. Um, anyway, um, but that is all we have time for today. So just thank you very much again to Michael, Simon and Enrico for joining us today and sharing their insight. I just want to let the audience know that today's webinar has been recorded and will be available to listen to on demand shortly on iGaming, on uh, sorry, on i365.com for you to rewatch and share with your colleagues. Otherwise, we'll see you very soon. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.